I'm really glad and to be here together with my wife. I remember it was last May that I was here for the training of the elders. And so a little bit over than a year back to be in Scotland in your church in Creef. My sister reached an important milestone in her life this August earlier. So as a treat, she flew in from Prague and we took her to Scotland for a week, but that was during the week so that I didn't go to the church because it was Monday through Friday and have been here again and beautiful weather the whole week it was wonderful so yeah all the time all the time yeah <laughs> steadfast faith it's part of your motto for this coming period 3 4 years what comes to your mind when you here, steadfast faith. Who of us wouldn't want to have steadfast faith? So often it's going up and down, and in our mind, steadfast is something that is steadfast. How often that is wishful thinking. And as there's not that much that I have to say, we need to get the message out of the text. So thank you very much for reading the story from Luke 24. If you open your Bibles or holy devices to Luke 24, 13. A few weeks ago I said in one place, you know, find it in your holy device, and a little girl said to her father, Dad, I didn't know you have a holy device. So if you have a Bible on it, then it's a holy device. On the same day, that is the day of resurrection, that is mentioned in the previous 12 verses, the two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles, so 11 kilometers, if you think in metric from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Two of them going to a village called Emmaus. One of them is Clophas. Interestingly enough, the Gospel of John says that at the cross were three women. One of them is Mary the wife of Clophas, or Cleopas, different readings. Why is Luke mentioning this story here? If you remember the way he started the story of Jesus, in chapter 2, verses 41 to 52, you read about two of them, Mary and Joseph, going away from Jerusalem one day journey and then they realize that Jesus is not with them and they look for him for three days and when finally they found him Jesus said to Mary didn't you know that I would be getting involved with my father's work in verse 30 one, we read, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Have you heard about a couple whose eyes were opened, Adam and Eve, and suddenly they saw things they did not see before? And so, Contemporary theologians will tell you that most probably there is a husband and wife, Clopas and Mary, or Cleopas and Mary, walking together. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now, NIV smoothes it a little bit. 
There is a tension in the story. They are more arguing than talking. Because they have a different perspective. If it's true that it's Mary and Cleopas, then Mary was there at the foot of the cross and she saw things that Cleophas or Cleophas did not see. And maybe they have a discussion because of the different varying viewpoints. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, verse 16, but they were kept from recognizing him. So he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? What's the talk? Remember Jesus telling his disciples when they finally caught up with him, what were you discussing on the way? Asking Matthew and Simon the Zealot, you guys are lagging behind. What's the discussion between a tax collector and a zealot? You had once again one of those never ending discussions about the nature of the kingdom. Remember, zealots are those who believe that every knife which is not in the back of a Roman is a wasted knife. And tax collectors are those who say, if I can make some profit, why shouldn't I steal from my fellow countrymen and pay the occupying force as long as some drachmas end up in my pocket in my bank account? And Jesus called these two and told them, the two of you will be rooming together as we walk around the Galilean dusty roads. So he asked them, what are you discussing? And they stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? Don't you watch BBC News, CNN? I was the only one who doesn't know that Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie are getting divorced. And interestingly enough, Jesus instead of saying, guys, have a look, it's me, it's Jesus. So I said, really? What things? Tell me. And listen to this. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. And the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. And now come the important words. But we had hoped that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. And we have hoped. things will turn out differently. And we have hoped. I don't know what you are feeling tonight as we start the Scottish camp meeting and the day of fellowship. How long have you been looking forward to this? What's in your heart? Certainly some joy. Certainly some expectation but maybe some disappointment, frustration, cynicism, that you don't want even to own up to yourself. We have hoped that things will turn out differently. We have hoped to raise a great family, wonderful children, have a long life. And then the doctor said, dot, dot, dot. We have been hoping, had this great dream, going to do wonderful things. And then the economic downturn came. I lost my job. Now I feel like such a failure. I have been hoping and then there is this issue in my life that I just can't seem to shake of its grip. 
I have been hoping, planning, but then he said he doesn't love me anymore. We had been hoping, and then our child ran down a road we never thought they would run down. We have been hoping that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. Who is going to make our story come out okay. But now it's all gone wrong. Do you understand what they are saying? Can you relate to what they are saying? And if you are honest, you know something about that story because it's our story. It relates to what you and I experience. It's a story being part of humanity. And for them it's even more difficult because they have been told that they are special people, they had special destiny, they had a calling. They are not here in this world just about themselves. They were going to be these glorious representatives of God of good and hope on earth, but their story had all gone wrong. There was no glory in Israel, just suffering. And we are back to the beginning when in slavery in Egypt, they are oppressed, but God leads them out with an outstretched arm to a great glorious future, only for their hopes to be dashed when one oppressor after another comes and rules over them. Syria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and now Rome. And we have hope that this time it's going to be different. It has been said that hope is the oxygen of the soul. To lose hope is to leak life and to close the door on the future. In three weeks' time, it will be the Sabbath, 22nd of October. 172 years since 100,000 to quarter of a million, 250,000 people hoped that Jesus would return and escort them to heavenly mansions. And we have hoped that it would come very, very soon. How many of us have been told that you are not going to finish your secondary school, you are never going to get married? Here you are, almost retirement age or slightly beyond. Still here we are, and we have hoped. Can you relate to that story? And Jesus comes along, he did things no one ever did. And they thought that now the story is going to end up right. He would lead some kind of revolution. And the goodness of human heart will be revealed and oppression will be overthrown. And the enemy will be dispelled and they will make they will be made prosperous and great so that the whole world will know that the God of Israel rules the world. He is the king of the world. We have been in Scotland for 100 years preaching the truth. And we are fortunate enough if there are 500 of us we have hoped. All these hopes, all these things seem to be going south, crushing. Now you can understand why they are so dejected. Try to put yourself in their place because no one expected that things will go this way. And when he died on the cross, 
that was the end of their hope. It was not just that he did not succeed. It was that it was clear he was not the Messiah. Crucifixion was what Rome did to demonstrate that some rebel is not the Messiah. It's not going to win. And they go on and say, even this day, we have heard these strange reports. Some women went to the tomb. They said the body is not there. They talked about seeing an angel. Everything is going crazy. We are going home. Can you imagine going home, back to their village, after a colossal failure, an error in judgment like that? How the fellow countrymen are going to welcome them and say, wow, so you thought you will have the positions with the Messiah. Well, come back to real life. Dropping everything to follow a rabbi because you thought that he was something that he apparently wasn't. You understand why they are so dejected. And so, notice how Jesus deals with them and the disappointment. Three times in this story, Luke is going to use the Greek word dianoigo, to open, to show you what Jesus does for them in this state of life. To change their disappointed faith into a steadfast faith. The first time it's in verse 31. As we said, what things about Jesus of Nazareth, what he did, now is the third day since it, this took place. In addition, verse 22, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, didn't find his body. They came and told us that they seen the vision of angels. Some of our companions went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. And Jesus, in a good fashion, of a pastoral care and pastoral heart, said, Tell me more. That must have been hard. How did that make you feel? You know what he said? How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe. All of that. Not much empathy. That's not what we teach students at Newbold. Foolish and slow in understanding. Didn't the Christ, and remember it's not the name, it's the anointed one, shouldn't the chosen one have to suffer these things and then enter the glory. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. In breaking of bread, dealing with the brokenness, their eyes were opened. For the first time, Luke is going to use dianoigo. A wonderful recognition scene. Their eyes are open and they recognize him again as a living person. Is it possible that life's disappointments cause us not to see certain things which are obvious? I mean, they are disciples. They have seen Jesus before. How come they don't recognize him? Now, we don't know why. 
We know from the story what they don't know. We know it's Jesus. And if you're like, guys, come on, come on, what's wrong with you? If you yeah, yeah, Jesus is right when he tells them you are slow in understanding. But in the stranger, they meet Jesus. Is it possible that we cannot see Jesus because our eyes are closed by life disappointments? Because we only rub shoulders with people like us and we don't allow any strangers into our lives? That you think, what can I learn from a liberal Anglican? Narrow-minded Muslim? Is it possible that we could meet Jesus in a stranger? They did. Now, of course, for us it happens differently, but it does happen. And it must happen because you would not be here. All of us met Jesus somehow, somewhere. And suddenly and slowly dawns on you that Jesus is alive, facing you, wide-eyed with wonder. We know him and know him anew. And although we walk the walk of faith afresh, we need to have our eyes open to his presence where we did not expect to see him. So I don't know what are your expectations for this weekend. Certainly seeing new leaders, saying goodbye to the old leaders, having good fellowship, wonderful food. Hopefully our eyes would be open to see Jesus in a new and more meaningful way, in spite of all the disappointments you and I constantly go through and don't talk about. Because our faith is triumphalistic faith, you know. The remnant is supposed to be successful. They are getting more perfect, ready for translation to pass the investigative judgment. So you don't talk about your disappointments. But there is one thing in life, you can't escape them. And the longer you live, the more of them you will collect along the way. Ernst Hemingway said it so poignantly. Life has a way of breaking down everybody. If you have just lived long enough, you are going to collect those disappointments. And hopefully, somehow, somewhere, in the most unexpected way, your eyes will be opened. And in a stranger, you meet Jesus. And you realize, actually, he's closer than you thought. He's there, I just did not see him. Because we have a way of expecting how things are supposed to turn out. How things are supposed to go when you pray, when you join the Remnant Church, when you become a minister, when you serve faithfully for years. And things go differently. But you know what's even more remarkable? I would expect that once you meet Jesus, that's it. Isn't that the high point of Christian journey? Once you can see Jesus and recognize him. But in Luke's account, there is something even more important than meeting Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong, it's important to meet Jesus. If you never meet him, how are you going to reflect on your experience? But Luke shows that meeting Jesus is not in the end of the journey. That the experience, however important it is, needs to have a sequel, needs to have a reflection on it. And so, in verse 32, we read, And he opened the scripture to them. Second time Luke uses dianoigo. 
And for someone who is not only a pastor, who helps people to encounter Jesus, but who served for more than 20 years as a theology professor, this is almost a holy ground. You see, there is more to life of a disciple than just meeting Jesus. To have our perspective on life changed, to have our dogmatics, the day we worship, the percentage of our income we sacrifice for charitable purposes, changed. The event is one thing, to reflect on it is another. And it's as important as the event itself. Because we need to reflect on what happened in our lives. But from what perspective? You can reflect from very different perspectives. But instead of saying, okay guys, have a look, it's me, it's Jesus. Instead, he opened the scriptures and starting with Moses, he made sure they understand how what the scripture says relates to him and to them. Instead of saying, it's me, and they would say, wow, isn't that wonderful? We'll do whatever you say. And 40 days later, he would be gone, and somebody who looks like an angel of the light would come and say, hey guys, I am Jesus. And they would say, whatever you say, we are going to believe. And you only produce gullible Christians. You don't produce mature believers with balanced theology. If you don't reflect on the happenings of your life, on the world in which we live, on your personal story. And while he opened the scripture, our hearts were burning. Now, as a poor Adventist pastor, I don't have many worldly possessions. But I tell you, I would give everything I have for an MP3 recording of that sermon. How can you go through all the Bible in less than two hours? Which stories did he use? How did he explain that the death was meaningful? That somehow it deals with the problem of sin and violence? How did he do that? I tell you, I would give everything I have to have the recording of that sermon. But he managed. He opened the scriptures and this set their hearts on fire. In a breathtaking way, he showed the purposes of God. He warmed the coldness of disappointment into a new flame of hope. I wish I could do that. He showed them the big picture. If you don't reflect on the events of life, you are going to miss the big picture. Because what happens to you this week, this month, these five years, these last 50 years, is part of the bigger story. It's only when you look back you can see the big story. Now we may be singing, he leadeth me, he leadeth me by my hand, he leadeth me. But if you sit in committees as we do, you wish, really? Really? I have seen leaders who have been ten times more intelligent than I am struggle with difficult issues this church is facing and not knowing the answer. Because somehow you don't see he leadeth me when you look into the future. You only see it when you look back. When you can see it as a part of the bigger story. 
And when they are breaking the bread over supper, their eyes are open, they recognize him, they reflect on their life, they see the big picture, they get the right perspective on things and events which have been confusing, disturbing, frustrating, disappointing before. Don't draw quick conclusions. Get the bigger picture. And only by opening the scripture you can get that. All right. And the third time Luke uses Dianoigo is in verse 44 and 45. He opened our mind to understand the scripture. You see, there is more to scripture than proof texts. There is more to scripture than these wonderful Old Testament prophecies somehow landed all on Jesus. And so what David said about his life was somehow also true about the life of Jesus. The one who was eating my bread has betrayed me, etc., etc. Verse 45 and 40, 44, and he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. When their eyes were opened after the first instance, there in verse 31, you know what happens? They get up and they walk seven miles back to Jerusalem. Fourteen mile marathon for these guys in the course of one afternoon and evening. Because their hearts are burning, they need to share it. And then when they join the disciples, Jesus appears again. And then we read in verse 45, and it was then that he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. Somehow, the eyes who are opened by his aliveness and personal presence, Jesus enrolls in this burning hearts seminary, or the class, however you are going to call it, He opens their minds. It's not simply enough to have a remarkable personal experience of living in Christ, however sensational. It's not enough to have your perspective changed. You need to see the bigger picture. How their story is part of the story of Israel and how the story of Israel is part of the bigger story of that first couple who when they took the fruit their, hearts are, their eyes are opened and they see the evil coming into this world. He now opens their eyes to see that somehow what the Messiah did is part of how God deals with the problem. And that the ultimate problem is not the Roman soldier standing on the street corner. It's not the bad personal thing that happened to me this week, this month. But that God deals with the bigger issues of this, of this universe. And that one day the story is going to turn out right. For most of us, studying and burning hearts do not go together. Studying the scripture, studying theology and having heart on fire seems mutually exclusive. But somehow for Jesus, it's different. Tell me, what would you expect him to do when he is resurrected on the Easter Sunday morning? What would you have done if you have been resurrected from dead and vindicated as Messiah? What would you expect him to do? Empty all the sick beds in Israel? Not so, seems to him. Throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple to prove his divinity. Here I am, have a look. No, he already faced this one before. Embark on a journey to Rome to unseat Caesar as the lord of the world. No, that position was his anyway. 
The priority of Jesus is so different and so striking. He spent much of those priceless 40 days helping the disciples to understand the Bible in a different light, to open their minds to understand the scripture, to get a different perspective. A little boy comes home crying, Mom, Mom, the children are laughing at me at school. They say, I am not your child. They say, I was adopted. Mom put his arms around him, took him, took him in, his, in her arms, set him on his lap and said, Johnny, look at it this way. The other children, the other parents have their children because they got them. We have you because we chose you. And he stopped crying. He saw it from a different perspective. We need our hearts and minds opened and to see this thing. We need our minds opened, expanded, to take the implications of what it means to live in 21st century Scotland. Otherwise we are just going to repeat what the pioneers did and to be disappointed as we have been for 172 years. We need more than just a wonderful experience with Jesus. We need steadfast faith. But what is a steadfast faith? It's a faith which goes beyond private devotional faith. It's faith that lead us, leads us into the realm of public truth. Here is the message that can change the world. Every man and woman can tear, tear up the script of their own self-made story and be part of the bigger story of God's bigger drama. Realize that on the third day, God walks not only in the cool of the evening, but in the dawn of a new day. The life of tomorrow has already begun. The tomorrow is not here, but it's already here. We live in new times. We do not need to relapse into disillusion or despair. Life in the middle does not need to be life in the muddle. The best is yet to come. And your story is part of that. That's what steadfast faith means. Shattering our closed world, opening us to endless possibilities. Because with Jesus, our disappointing story is not the end of the story. God creates, he redeems, he calls, he chooses, he works his purposes through painful experiences, bringing them to a wonderful climax, even in a disappointing event as the cross of Jesus. Jesus opened an old book and showed a new vision. And his spirit lights a fire in our hearts again in the cold waters of a skeptical world Fires which cannot be quenched. Fires that bring steadfast faith for you and me. If we see that our story is part of the bigger story. Can you ask for anything better than this? Because each one of us can have steadfast faith. Amen.